No, not at all. But we won't say amen. We're going to move on in the presence of the Lord. We are living in a time where we need all the God we can request. And of course, that's what we do. The Lord told the prophet Isaiah, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. He said we ought to forsake our wicked ways and let us return unto the Lord. And this is the time of year where we, we all certainly take a significantly closer look and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So as we go, this being uh, Passion Week, and we're looking forward Sunday to a mighty time in the Lord. I was talking to a pastor on earlier this week, and uh, we encouraged each other that the fact that God allows you to stand in his pulpit and then he gives us signs that he's with us and so when the Lord is with you I just want the Lord to say to me on that great getting up day of mine Sunday we're going to celebrate that great getting up day of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ but when I have my great getting up day I just want to hear it said well done that what you were given, you were faithful with. And as Paul often stated, it's not all how you start, it's how you finish. So we want to finish strong in the Lord. And so we're going to celebrate the Lord this Resurrection Sunday. Easter eggs and the bunny rabbits and hide and go seek. All of that is relative to what the world sees for this Sunday. But we as believers and those that have had the Lord revealed to us in no uncertain terms, we want to make sure we don't lose sight of the fact that what we are celebrating this Sunday is that great getting up day that resurrection day that made every promise Jesus made come true. Because Paul said, if the Lord be not risen, he said, then we are still in our sins and we are men most miserable. But we're not miserable because he did rise and he is seated in the heavens on the right hand of the Father, making intercession for the saints. So as we go into this Sunday observation, this resurrection observation, I thought it'd be very prudent tonight for us to focus on the Lord our God and, and how it is so easy for even believers to think we are worshiping to God. They worship Jesus here. Then they worship God there. And in our infancy in salvation, in our unlearned condition as a believer, God allows that because his main focus for our salvation is that our faith is in him as Lord and that we believe that God raised him from the dead. And people are always, are not always able to uh, make the distinction. It's very easy to see God and Jesus as two different people. I mean, we can sort of recollect. We can recollect when we talk about the spirit being one. Because we being people we all realize we have a spirit. We have animation. 
And that's what the spirit does. It gives life. The spirit allows us to be animated. So we recognize that even though we are one person, we have a spirit. We recognize a lot of us in the kingdom that we are tripod type beings. We are tripod type beings, meaning we are threefold. Uh, Paul taught uh, the church that we were body, soul, and spirit. In his letter, he even said, I hope this letter finds you safe and peace. And he said, I pray that you, your whole soul, spirit, and body be saved. So he recognized that there is a belief system that even though we are one person, we're made up of the outer layer, the inner part, which is our mind, emotions, and our will, it constitutes our soul. And we recognize it, it has a separate function, the soul does. It's where our senses are. It's where our mind and our common sense permeates from. Then we even are able to see the spirit part. Even if you're not saved, it is not difficult to recognize that what allows the human body to be animated is the spirit. And that all animals, anything that moves has a, has a spirit. But in the Lord, God being the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if we are not careful, if we are unlearned, if God has not, if the Holy Spirit has not given us the revelation, it is then easy for us to see Jesus, God, as separate. Well, we're going to look at that. We're going to look at that on tonight. Matter of fact, if you thought that, you are not by yourself. We're going to see tonight where even people in the Bible discuss, I saw the Lord sitting on the right hand of the Father. But God wants us to realize the part that Jesus played he told the prophet, he said, sacrifices, and he said that sacrifices and offerings thou wouldest not. He said, but thou hast prepared a body for me. In that body was God in the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And because Jesus was a real person, because he was a man, it is easy for us to see him separately as the Father. His role was separate in that the just uniqueness, the, the, the awesome intelligence, the mind of God, will we, will, we can't come close to with all the computers in the world joined together, you would not be able to comprehend the width, the, the depth, and the height of our God. But God did the miraculous to accomplish the miraculous. He sent his son. He came in the form of a man, a divine Conception. And God came in the person of Jesus. Jesus was God incarnate. But once we get into the spirit realm, and when Jesus ascended back to the throne, we have to be careful. Not to see God and Jesus as two people. 
The work Jesus did as Savior, it was done on the earth. Once he had paid the ultimate price, once he, he was the propitiation for our sins, and once he accomplishes that, and he goes back to glory, we're going to look at tonight that there's not two people up there. There's not three people. We pray in Jesus' name because even still, he is the intercessor. He was the one that paid the human cost. And for that reason, by God's own design, it was God's sovereign will to do it this way. No explanation needed. He made it to the degree that when we come to him, because God is all righteous, truth, and light, that no darkness can be in his presence. But because of his infinite wisdom, God decided what he would do. Amen. He decided that what he would do is he would perform that work in and of himself. He did it in the person of Jesus Christ. So for that reason, when we come to the Lord, we have to come to him in the name of the one that performed that work. Y'all need that air down some more. We can, we can push it down a little more. Thank God for Jessica and Daquan and the family. Coming in, I thought I saw Sister Lassa sitting in the parking lot. Then I said, "Well, maybe Jessica then reached out. She went by there to get them. We're going to go on anyway." So we honor the Lord tonight for all of you that have come. Thank God for our streaming audience here at Cedar Refuge Christian Center as we dive tonight into what is very important in the kingdom, and that is that we. Recognize as we go into our, uh, Resurrection Sunday that the Lord our God, and we're going into that day to observe that Jesus rose from the dead and he ascended, making our salvation sure. He assured our continued eternal existence in glory by his resurrection and the work that he did. But we want to be very clear. God said several places in the Bible, including in the book of Deuteronomy, he says, I am he. I am God. He says, I heal and I wound. He says, I Killed, I make a lie. Then he says something very important. He said, and there is no God with me. So we want to recognize that. Uh, on that button, if you drop that down, because I can feel the heat too. I'll do it. Huh? Because I didn't, I didn't really set it. I didn't set it till I got it. We had an unexpected visitor on today. Drove down from New York. I guess he was running from the subway shooter. I joked with him. When he got there, I said, hey, man, they caught the guy. You've gone back to Brooklyn now. But my wife's brother drove down, come to check on her. So normally we would have cooled the place down. Let's jump into the word. In our handout, it says this, this is 
the, not the title of this study is the Lord our God is one God. And throughout scripture, we always find where there's, there's text that says, and I saw God, I saw Jesus sitting on the right hand and God throughout scripture speaks about things being on his right hand. The Bible is not a contradiction. If we're confused anywhere in scripture, it's the confusion is with us. One thing I like about these scriptures concerning the oneness of God is that we're living in a time now where many scholars have read and dissected every part of the Bible. And God intended it that way. If God didn't want us to know what was going on, he wouldn't have sent the Bible. But we have scholars today that have spent exhaustive time examining every part of the scripture from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. And what we are able to confirm is that I was saying it on Sunday. We have to read the word of God. We have to take it in context. The infant Christian, what I mean by infant, I don't mean infant like Trayon and Desmond. I'm so glad to see them two young men. I see Desmond all the time. He just don't see me. <laughs> Raise your hand. Say hi, Desmond. Raise your hand, Desmond. That's the way he started out. He won't talk to nobody. He wouldn't talk to nobody. That you know what that means, just That means he's been gone too long. Because he used to talk to me every time he came in here. Raise your hand, Trayon. I don't see Trayon as often as I see Desmond, so that means he's where he's supposed to be. The one thing about Jessica, she'll let her kids be ripping and running all from down the street and everywhere. Thank God for Daquan. I was able to. God made a way for us to sit down on yesterday. I need to such ready. I mean, I mean, you know, some things we don't have to report. But I did say, she asked about you guys all the time. But I say, I'm going to just hold on. And I thank you. God is going to do just what he said. Y'all hang in there. Amen. Amen. In our scripture, let's go to the book of Revelation, <clears throat> chapter 4. We're going to the book of Revelation, chapter number 4. We, we have mentors. Oh, uh, get, get the one out of my office. No, get the one out of my office. This, this, the, the, the study Bible. One of my mentors is he is he is very hard on church doctrines, which seem to suggest that there's more than one God, more than one throne. Matter of fact, there are uh, Christian church organizations out there today that actually teach that Jesus and God are not the same person. Uh, the Quran teaches that, yeah, that Jesus was a prophet. And of course he, he was a prophet. But he was also high priest. The role he played on the earth, he only became the high priest at his death. In the Gospels, Jesus is never referred to in the Gospels as a priest. But in Revelation chapter 4, John the Beloved having been given the image of God, 
John makes it very clear in his explanation that God brought him up into heaven to give him a vision of heaven. And the Bible goes on to say, John said, when that happened, he said, I was in the spirit. So that means that he was either transformed bodily, which I don't think happened, and I'll tell you why, or that God took him there in the spirit or in a vision. We've heard people say, we won't argue the point, that people have suggested many times of having out-of-body experiences. So we know such a thing occurred. We don't know whether, and even John says, I don't know whether I was in a vision or whether I was in the spirit. All he know is that he was, he was there. Are you with me? But in the book of Revelation, he says in verse 1, chapter 4, he said, after this I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, as it were, of a trumpet talking to me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be, watch this, hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. And one that sat on the throne. John is saying. Immediately. My physical revelation. Of where I'm at is now gone. I'm either. Having a vision. Or. I'm having an out of body experience. But he says. But when I looked. He said behold. There was. A throne. How many thrones? A throne. Not two thrones. A throne. And one that sat on the throne. So there's one throne. And one that sat on the throne. So if I see Jesus sitting on the right hand of God, then where was he at? Because John said all he saw was one throne and one person sitting on the throne. He said, and he that sat upon, he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Now, round about the throne were the twenty and four seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. They had on their heads crowns of gold. So, let's dismiss for the moment that there's two people. Jesus said there was one person. And that there was one throne. Are you with me? But. It's always a but. But. If you look down on your handout. Acts 7. And 54. On Acts 7 and 54. What we see here. Is the death of Stephen. Who was the first one to be martyred for the gospel. Now Jesus was the first one. Stephen was the first one to be martyred or martyred for the gospel's sake. Stephen was one of the initial deacons that was appointed by Peter. Stephen was prosecuted. Let's say persecuted 
for the gospel. They have Stephen in chapter 7. They have him judged. And they have decided that you got one opportunity to speak for yourself. Also sitting here watching this discourse was the would-be who would become the apostle Paul. Now, he, and currently, he's, his name is Saul. He's a Pharisee who persecutes Christians. And so Paul is sitting there, and it's so amazing that God then turned around and used the greatest persecutor of the church to be one of the greatest apostles in the New Testament church. But at this particular at this particular time, Paul is sitting, Saul is sitting there. He's watching all of this. And he's enjoying it. So the Bible says when they get Stephen to the point where they say, you are guilty of blasphemy. In their day, the penalty for blasphemy was death. Are you with me? So he sits there and he proclaims that the Lord Jesus, whom he's never seen, is going to save him. And so the Pharisees and the Jews are sitting there and saying, well, I sure, Peter. Huh? I'm in the book of Acts, chapter 7, verse 57. It's on your handout. You don't have to get it out of the Bible. It's on your handout. Page one, the bottom. So, when he's standing here justifying, he had to defend his cause. This is why, church, there comes a time when you have to defend your faith. You have to be able to defend your faith. And sometimes all you have is faith. But in that day, just like with Paul, God gave Stephen what to say. St Stephen having operated purely by faith. He knows nothing about any certainty of what will happen when he dies. All he knows, like us, is that Jesus had gave us his word. So as we look at the bottom of our hand now, on the first page, Acts 7, verse 54, Verse 55, he says in 54, when they heard these things, when they heard Stephen's defense, he didn't get up there like Peter did the first time and deny Jesus. He didn't get up there and get all wimpy like some of us get now when it comes time to defend our faith. He didn't get weak kneed and, and become a coward like some of us do today when confronted with what God says our life and lifestyle should be versus what people around us think. And they want to say, well, who do you think that you are? That yesterday I knew what you was doing. I knew who you was yesterday. How all of a sudden today you're trying to be something else. Well, when God converts us, that is exactly the case. So instead of him running and hiding his faith, he stood there and proclaimed the promise the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Bible said when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. They just wanted to tear him apart. Dequan. But the Bible says in verse 55, knowing he's getting ready to face death, Stephen being full of the Holy Ghost, that's important because if he's full of the Holy Ghost, he is now in the spirit realm. When we walk by the Spirit, then what's being transformed for us is of God. When we walk in the flesh, what we see is the natural. But he's in the Spirit, and he's looking into the sky. Why? Because he knows they're getting ready to do him in. And he's standing, standing tall, said, I'm going to stand on this word. All I got to really go on is the conviction in my heart and the belief that what the apostles taught me was true. And the Bible says when he looked up into heaven, he saw what? 
the glory of God. And what's that? Jesus standing on the right hand. Wait a minute. I thought we just said that, that there was only one throne. And that the only person that was sitting on that throne was God. Verse 56. And he and said, Behold, I see the heavens open. Watch this. And the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And when the people heard that, that he was saying, he's having, evidently he's having a talk with the Lord. They said, man, they cried out with a loud voice, put their hand on their ear, and ran. Because they're saying now, what we're seeing is we're watching some guy that's already seen somewhere else. He has left this plane that we're in. You ever ran upon somebody again? And, and I know you didn't see it on TV. And they go to certain people talking to them, asking them questions, and their mind is somewhere else. Well, this is what they were doing. But now, James says that he saw the heavens open, and he saw the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So now I ask you the question. John said there was one throne and one God. <clears throat> Stephen said there was, uh, he saw God sitting on the throne and that he saw Jesus standing on the right hand. So was it one God or was there two God? Was there one person on the throne or was there two? I'm glad y'all asked. That's the purpose of this lesson. Tonight. Go ahead. You want to say something? Was it one God or was there two? I think it's one. Hey, Mr. B. Well, you did, but you don't realize it. Keep coming. You got it. You still got it, Treyon. There's only one God. When we look, I want you to look down on your handout at the bottom. It says, the right hand of God. When we think about being on the right hand of God, there is a lot of scripture that breaks this down for us to distinguish what is meant when the Bible actually says on the right hand. God even told David, David said, God told Jesus, come sit at my feet until I make your enemies. Your works to it. But watch this. Psalms 43, 44 and 3. By their own sword they did not possess the land. And by their own arm did not save them. But your right hand and your arm and the light of your presence. For you favored them. Psalm 17. Wondrously show your loving kindness, O Savior. Of those who take refuge at your right hand from those who rise up against you. Page three. Also, you have also given me the shield of your salvation and your right hand upholds me. And your gentleness makes me great. Psalms 20. Now that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. So what the Bible is simply telling us here is when the Bible speaks of God's right hand. Let's go back to page one, to page two. When, when God speaks of his right hand, it's clear the deepest meaning of this expression is that the right hand of God is the energy of his unlimited power. Therefore, the deepest meaning of the expression, when the Bible refers to something being at his right hand, what it's really saying, it's wielding 
the might of his omnipotence. God's right hand. The vision Stephen had was a confirmation of Jesus' word that all power will be given unto me in the heavens and the earth. And this is what we're really going to look at tonight. How what Stephen saw was a manifestation of the promise of God because he knew, God knew he was coming. God wanted to assure him when he got there, what I promised, I'm going to deliver. So, Exactly. That's the only way, that's the only way I can explain it. Like well, that, in our in our natural senses, like you said, we have to be able to process like some people can't process, they still as one. Like Mel so what is it there? Uh, no, I'm kidding. Kidding. And, and in the beginning. And you know, uh, he was revealing even in the beginning. You know. So well, even when we say he advocates, we still don't look at it like that's two or three. But one of the things we're going to look at on so Sunday. One of the things, one of the things we're going to look at on Sunday is the power of his resurrection. And what God did, we go back now to what John the Beloved wrote. He said when he when he beheld and a door was opened in heaven. And the first verse, the first voice that he heard come out of it was that of a, of a trumpet. And then he says in verse 2, Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne sat in heaven. And one that sat on the throne. So what did Stephen see? If Stephen says that he beheld and there was the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand. You know, trying to say the spiritual realm, but still, it was like that one God was revealing to Stephen during that time. He knew he was in the wrong direction to redeem the world. So, the only way I can explain it, like in the spiritual sense, like. Well, let me see if I can. Let me see if I can help you out here. Yeah. Stephen was seeing. What was to come. Right, that's what I said. Now, when God spoke to John, one of the things John writes, he told him that one of the things that he would see, he said, was he was going to show him. Verse 1. And the voice, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, I will show thee things which must come hereafter. Now, when James is looking, when John is looking, God is showing him things which has already happened. John is there in the present tense, but God is saying to him, I'm going to also show you things which must happen after. So he was seeing the past, the present, and the future. And why do I say that? When John wrote this, Jesus was already dead. The, same, the person Jesus. When Stephen died, Jesus is already gone. So he's able to deliver now. 
on the promise because he's now in heaven. Stephen won't understand this fully until he gets there. But what God wanted Stephen to know, your labor was not in vain. So what does he show him? He shows him Jesus who's the Savior. Standing on the right hand. Now watch this, page three. What is the significance of the right hand of God? This is not a physical manifestation. He is seeing it. He is, he, he, remember now, got to picture this. Stephen is in the spirit. The Bible says he looks up. Immediately he's in the spirit. Yes, he sees it. Yes, he saw two people. I'm getting ready to tell you. Get ready to explain. What Stephen sees is a vision. He sees God on the throne. Why is it so important that he see Jesus? Because Jesus was the same. Jesus was the one that said, I go to prepare a place for you. And then when I finish, I'm coming back. So God wanted James, God wanted Stephen to see Jesus. Now, Sunday, when we look at verse 5, John is going to say, in the midst of the throne, he saw a lamb. Remember, now, you don't want to miss Sunday's message. Because it's the lamb that comes up and takes the book out of God's hand. But we know a lamb was not in heaven. Why? Because the Bible is very clear. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. So there was no lamb. What they saw was a vision of the lamb. What they saw was the spiritual representation of what Jesus represented, which was a sacrificial lamb. Now, why didn't Stephen see the lamb? Be huh? Go ahead. No, why did Stephen not see? Right. No, but but what? Why didn't Stephen see the lamb? Well, Stephen was in a situation where Lamb wasn't going to help Stephen. Because Jesus, the Lamb, was not going to save him. Who was going to save him? Jesus the Savior. He would see him later on. He's going to John will describe him as a lion. Mm -hmm. What John saw in the beginning of chapter 5 was a lamb that looked to have a wound. Well, we know, again, Jesus would not be standing up there with a, a recent bleeding wound because the lamb is flesh and the blood is blood, which neither can inherit can you. But what Stephen needed to see was the mighty lamb, the mighty lion. Stephen saw the re, the, the glorified Jesus, who is God. God let him see Jesus for who he is. I saved you. It's a vision. But it doesn't represent two people. Stephen was saying what he saw. He saw the father sitting on the throne and Jesus standing there saying, Stephen, I'm going to do just what I said. A lot of people may see that because that's where their faith is. Look, look at what Genesis writes. In ancient times, a person with high rank, they would always stand on the right hand of the king. The right hand represents the power and the strength. We say it all the time. He's my right hand man. But when we talk about it, 
We're saying this person is my right hand man. Normally that meant this was the strongest person. This is the person I'm relying on the most. Not in the spiritual realm. Why God the Father does not consist of a physical body like humans do. The right hand of God is often used figuratively in scripture. In the Old Testament, the phrase is used to refer to the coming Messiah. Again, in Psalms 110 and 1, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my footstool. Psalms 118, the right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. What the right hand of God means in context is it is the strength of God. When in Revelation 5, the Lamb takes the book from God, in layman terms, try to picture this if you will, the Lamb is here on the right hand. And God is here on the throne. And the lamb takes the book from the Lord. The lamb is taking the book from who? Himself. That's the best way I can put it for our little human mind. It's like the lamb of God is standing there and as he takes the book from him that sat on the throne, the lamb figuratively is taking the book from himself. Why? Because the right hand of God is the strong hand, but it's one God. Just like doing this. But we have to recognize the existence of Jesus. Because God said it was Jesus that did the work of salvation. God said he would reward him to sit on David's throne forever. I used to always teach him years ago when I didn't have a good understanding. But it meant that the Lord had just gave it to me, Daquan, because it wasn't nothing I read. It was just a picture God put in my mind. I said, one day we're going to get to heaven we're going to all get to see Jesus, the Lamb, God, and the Holy Spirit all become one. Because early on, I too, like everybody else, because the Bible expressly speaks of God and Jesus operating differently, that it's easy for people to imagine, especially when we know Jesus was a real person. While he walked the earth, he served a earthly purpose. But once he died, when he was on that cross and the guards came to kill him because they had to take the crosses down because the next day was the Sabbath day and they couldn't hang people on the Sabbath day. So then the leader gave the order because there were three people up there. He said, okay, you got to go kill him. You know, uh, being crucified was the absolute worst death you could possibly experience during that time. Because they would either nail you or tie you to the cross. Nail or tie your feet. Nails were the worst because they actually cut into your skin. They would put ropes around their waist in case the nail pulled through their skin, through the hand. They still couldn't come off that cross. And basically, the windpipe, the upper, uh, your upper respiratory area and your chest, eventually you would bend over like this. Basically, you would suffocate. And it took a long time. Sometimes it took days to do it. But when they realized the Sabbath was coming, when they put them on the cross that Friday, they had to take them down that night because the next day was the Sabbath. So when they went to Killed Jesus. He was already dead. Bible says when he said Eli, Eli, 
uh, uh, Eli Sabachthani, he gave up the ghost. And he said, nobody killed me. Nobody took my life. I gave my life. So immediately, the Holy Spirit left the physical man on the cross. What they buried was the physical body of Jesus. His spirit was already gone. It already gone to the grave. It went down to the grave, preached the gospel, took the keys from death and hell. The Bible said when he rose the third day, he rose with all power. He had took the keys to death and hell, proving to Satan, I'm God. You have no more authority over my people. If a man dies in his sin, his body belongs to you. His soul will stay in him until the day of judgment. When I pass judgment, but Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? There is none for the believer. The, the grave don't hold us when we die. Death doesn't hold us when we die. Because the soul already belongs to God. And so when Jesus, when they buried the body, what made the significance for us as believers, when Mary and Mary and Mary Magdalene went to the tomb the next day after the Sabbath to give Jesus a proper burial, they found the stone rolled away. And the angel was sitting there and white. He said, what, what, what came you to see? He said, he's not here. He's risen. On the third day, the physical body was gone. Because Jesus came back, entered that body. How do I know that? He showed himself to Mary and the other women. He showed himself to the apostles. He even showed Stephen the holes that was in his hand and his side, demonstrating to them that it was the physical body that Jesus was in. So there will be no doubt, this is no trick. He even told Stephen, I'm going to prove it to you more. Give me some food, I'll eat. <clears throat> then he tells them, after the Bible says he was seen by about 50 people, he then tells, he calls the disciples to the upper room and has communion. And he says to them, tarry ye here in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Thus, we celebrate Trayon, the day of Pentecost, meaning 50. 50 days after his resurrection, that was the day that the Holy Spirit failed. Fulfilling Jesus' promise in John 14 and 26, when he says, when I go, he says, the Father will send, he said, I will send you another comforter, whom the Father will send in my name. Demonstrating again the oneness of the Trinity. And then he went on to describe who that person would be. He didn't leave it for us to guess. He said, who is the Holy Spirit? The Father will send you another comforter. Who is the Holy Spirit? And he will come and he will teach you. And he will bring all things back to your remembrance. So the power of the church was Jesus blessing the church, the power of the church, the, the earnest or the token of the church is the Holy Spirit. So we have to cherish the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the power of the glory. And so when Jesus ascends, now he gets back to heaven. Now he's back in glory. Again, the Bible says he ascended into heaven and he set it on the right hand. So we have to picture God sitting on the throne. Jesus, there, they're one. And Jesus is now the right hand. 
Because he's God. He always was God. And a lot of this they used to teach us back in the day. A lot of this we won't understand until we get there. That's why God has always told teachers and preachers to keep the gospel simple. Sometimes people teach the Trinity to people that are not able to receive it yet. And I believe God will also bless those who see him as one God. Their faith is in God. We've been taught to pray in Jesus' name. And so I think God will not condemn anybody for their ignorance if their heart is pure. But we again, we're living in a time now where God made, God told, Jesus told the apostles, he says, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, he says, I'll love you and the Father will love you. And we will come and make our abode with you. And he says, I will manifest myself to you. <laughs> then God gives you that revelation where you can pray Jesus. But still know Jesus is the intercessor. And if he and God are one, if Jesus is the right hand of God, if I'm praying to Jesus, I'm praying to God, I just need to acknowledge Jesus because he is the one that has paved the way for us to be there. Without the part Jesus played, we have no access to God. I tell people, I think it's all if it, go ahead. That's when faith kick in. You know, you just have to, you just have to, uh, that's when your faith kick in and your spiritual realm. To me, the way I look at it, like, you know, they split off. They, they as one, they kind of split up here. I am back as one, but it still was one. Mm -hmm. That's the only way my brain can process it by faith, because it still is one. Right. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Only way my brain can process it and not hurt me is, you know, Jesus the Savior. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. day, even we mess up half day one, but it still is one. It's like they kind of split up as one, but it still was one. You know, that's the way I can explain it. Well, again, we have to look at the role that that Jesus played in the flesh. They were a separate entity when Jesus walked the earth. He was God in the flesh, but he was still serving a separate function. The price had not been paid yet, Daquan. So until Jesus actually paid the price, he still had to be seen as separate, but equal. Paul said, to the Colossians, that in Jesus was the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and it's in him that we live, move, and have our being. Jesus is the intercessor. But, but he's only one God. And we just have to see him as God. We see the work that he did as Savior. The book of Hebrews says he became the high priest because of what he did. Jesus was not a high priest after the order of Aaron. Aaron and them were humans. The Old Testament priests, they all died. The Old Testament priests, they all sinned. Which meant they had a limited lifespan. Why? Because God told Noah, because the evil of man was so great. God said, I'm not letting these guys live two, three thousand years no more. That you won't get to be as old as Methuselah. Remember, we used to come up and people say, You're old as Methuselah. God said, That's not going to happen no more. He said, I, I, can't, I can't tolerate this for no eight, nine hundred years. He said, The number of your years would be 120. And that's if you live to see that. Very few people live to see 120. But God says, Your time on the earth is going to be limited. So the time that we have, we have to surrender. When you start seeing Jesus in this light, you start seeing a real person. We don't pray to a mythical God. 
We don't pray to an entity. Like sometimes, this is why you have to be careful when you pray. When you pray, he said, you have to pray by faith. You have to believe that God has given us a privilege of communicating with him. He did that through Jesus. Otherwise, we are not worthy to come before God. Because God said, I'll make this very simple for y'all. I'm going to give you ten commandments. Keep those ten commandments, Trayon. God says, you'll be up here in heaven with me, no problem. But what was the problem with that, Trayon? What's the problem with ten commandments? Trayon. Can you keep all the Ten Commandments? There you go. And he's a kid. So imagine as an adult. And he got a long ways to go. Lord willing. Nobody could keep the Ten Commandments. So Jesus came to fulfill that. So for that reason, God says when John the Baptist baptized him, God said to Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So God says, all authority now while he's on the earth, you need to listen. Because what he proclaims while he's on the earth, which is a manifestation of what he wrote going all the way back to Genesis 1, Jesus is the word. Some scholars I know don't even like using the term second and third person of the Trinity. Because when you use first, second, and third, that denotes succession. That denotes levels of importance, right? If I'm first, you're second. And Patty's third, then that means if you want something, and you want to go straight to the top. You're coming to me. So for that reason, a lot of scholars don't even like to look at the Trinity as the first, second, and third person because Jesus already said, I and the Father are one. And we know the spirit role is always present. If I say, I'm going to, I'll be right back. Like I said earlier, I'm going to go make an adjustment. When I said that, Trey, my mind told my spirit, he's getting ready. He wants to go over there. So what did my natural spirit do? It turned me around. It made my feet start moving. It allowed my brain to focus on what needed to be done over there. Click the button, turn around and come back. So we can see the consistency of the spirit. What the Lord wants us to see is the consistency that exists between the father and the son and that the role Jesus played, it was a situation that he and God had already, that God had already discussed. And again, when the Bible speaks in Genesis, when the Bible speaks in of uh, Genesis uh, 3 or uh, Genesis 1 when the Bible speaks when God said let us go down to Babel when he said let us make men he was not talking to no committee he was talking to the Godhead and so we see that now because God made a permanent place for Jesus but that place was in his heart that make any sense. You can have you have a mother's understanding. When they say I have a love for my child, they will always be in my heart. Oh, it's a mind clear. Any question? Amen. Again, we want to just thank you and get prepared for a mighty display of God on Sunday. Yes, Trevor. No, I'm saying when, 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 when Stephen got ready to go, when they got ready to send Stephen, 
Stephen was not wanting to see somebody being killed. He was getting ready to be killed. So for God to show Stephen a lamb in heaven being slaughtered like he was getting ready to be slaughtered, it would make Stephen think, this is what's getting ready to happen to me. But Stephen's teaching and his faith had dictated that when I go, Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he said, you'll be there with me. So Stephen being the first martyr, God allowed him to see Jesus as who Jesus was. He saw him as the strong arm of the Lord. He was on his right hand. He saw him as the strong arm. Stephen needed to see this. But it was not a literal event. What Stephen saw was real. But what God was allowing him to see, again, it takes us into the supernatural. Just like he told John the Beloved. What I'm going to teach you in the book of Revelation, this is one thing we have to understand about the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation, you ever go to a movie? You ever go to a 3D movie? Three-dimensional? Three-dimensional movie makes it look like you're actually in the picture. The, 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 uh, uh, the, the way it's shown, the way it's revealed, it's almost like what you're seeing is like, you, like you're in the TV set. Well, what God was trying to show John in the book of Revelation, he was showing it to John in 3D. He was showing John things that had happened in the past. Trayon. He was showing John things that was happening right now, which was that God was on the throne. He was showing him the lamb that had already happened. Even in Revelation 7 and 18, we find where the Bible says the Lord was on a horse and said his vesture was as blood. Where what he was seeing was Jesus coming in the apocalypse to take revenge on the Lord against the enemies when he comes back for the second coming. Bible says he was on a pale gray horse. Death was his name. And that his vesture was dripped in red. Again, we know Jesus didn't have no red vesture dripped in red in the present tense because he had already been slain and there was no suggestion in scripture for us to believe that anybody made Jesus bleed in heaven. Just like there's nothing in scripture that would leave us or lead us to, to conclude that what John saw was a bleeding lamb. What he saw was that the lamb and the son were the right arm of God and the authority of God and what God had promised what the lamb represented was the sacrifice Jesus was that lamb see the lamb demonstrated that's what they used to kill as a sin sacrifice they would kill sheep Bible says Jesus became the greatest sacrifice he was the perfect sacrifice and that prior to that he became the perfect high priest why he officiated over his own sacrifice oh man this is some wonderful stuff but we're going to stop any more questions father we thank you tonight for this lesson God we thank you for manifesting yourself to us we thank you for all of these again that have come, those that are watching by our live feed. God, that you will give revelation. More importantly, that you will save and deliver in the name of Jesus. God, we pray for the lives of these that have come seeking you. And God, that you will allow our days to become brighter and give us 
restful nights. God, we're going to thank you for it because you've asked us to seek you. You said you are knocking at the door of our heart and that if we open the door, you would come in. So Lord, we're asking you, come into the heart of them that labor and are heavy laden and give them rest. Tear down the wall of petition. It separates us from you and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.